Today we have one simple objective. Turn platinum metallic powder into shiny platinum ingots. To achieve this, we'll need to set up lots of machinery, build a complex web of interconnected chemical processes, and wire everything into the existing infrastructure. I have a feeling this might be a lengthy episode, so as our favourite slab would say... Let's write something that will make us smile. How about... Uh, okay, there we go. Yeah. There we go, perfect. It says... Go get your snacks. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to New Horizons. Who's ready for a challenge today? I think this is going to be quite the challenge. Lots and lots of obstacles to overcome. And the first challenge is location. We need a lot of space for this. So at the end of episode 46, we picked out a location on the southeastern side of our base. Over the past five or six hours, maybe more, I made use of the Buildcraft filler and excavated the pretty much solid terrain. And then lots and lots of trial and error, many hours of development, we go from looking at a blank wall into what is now the location of the platline. Oh yeah, so it's built, but it's not finished yet. There's still a lot of development and polish to be done. This is pretty much just the shell of the room. And I'm not sure exactly if this grass is going to stay here. So yeah, it stays pretty consistent with the rest of the base. I went with a white theme in here, which may or may not be changed later on. Mostly though, it's a pretty simple build. Most of the complexity is going to come in the machines. Everything, as always, has been chunk aligned, so none of the multi-blocks should cross the boundary. And some advice I always try to follow myself is try not to build yourself into a corner. So we have some doorways leading nowhere right now, but there's plenty of space back here. This is to the northern side of our valley, pretty much untouched land. We have, of course, everything back here. I didn't put the back wall on it yet since I'm not sure if this is going to be enough space. I suspect it's going to be more than enough though. And then on the opposite side, on the south side, we have this one, which is eventually going to lead us through to this main, main section that's been built for a while. And then, of course, finally, we have this doorway on the end. Actually, there's two doorways, the one we came in and then also this one, which leads out to the rocket silo. Oh yeah, I guess there is one more exit entrance to this place and that is this staircase. We have plenty of space for wiring underneath and the bats. <laughs> These guys are going to be annoying us all episode. Oh yeah, speaking of the bats, check this out. This place looks super cool without night vision. Unfortunately, we can't run it in that state yet because we don't have enough lights in here. But I hope one day we can run the whole base without having to use night vision. And I also forgot to build the window that was supposed to be here. Connecting the inside to the outside. Yeah, we can tackle a lot of the building a little later on, but for now we have a lot to figure out with the machines. Oh yeah, we also have a travel anchor down there. Yeah, this will see some very heavy use, I think. I'm also really hoping we have enough material for today to get everything crafted. But to help us find out, I think we should develop a robust plan so that we can figure out how we're going to make this platinum dust and then also perhaps look at some of the more advanced platinum processing since some of the byproducts from platinum processing can also allow us to get into things like iridium, osmium, osmiridium, ruthenium, ruridit, rhodium, palladium, rhodium plated palladium and there might even be another one I'm missing here. But yeah, the point is it doesn't stop with platinum. Platinum is just at the beginning of this chain. Yeah, things are about to get chemically crazy. Alright, so taking a step out of the game for a second, I really think it would be a good idea to use all of the tools at our disposal. So first of all, thank you Penguin for making this flowchart. Not a penguin. And so yeah, this is pretty much what we are dealing with today. Every yellow box represents a machine, so there's a lot of machines to do. All of the blues are process inputs. For example, oxygen and sulfur. And then all of these dark pink ones here is going to be products from the other line. So you can see here the ingots I was talking about. Platinum, iridium, osmium, ruthenium, rhodium and palladium. So for example, in the platinum line, which is the first one we'll start with, we are going to get something called palladium enriched ammonia and that has to be sent over to the palladium line over here this is one of the inputs palladium enriched ammonia 
And that is something that occurs throughout this whole process, which is why we're grouping all these machines together. However, there's also some things which we'll have to get independently, chlorine being one of those. That one specifically though shouldn't be any issue because of the crops, in fact we are swimming in chlorine. And just looking through a few others here, hydrochloric we already have, sulphur we have, potassium we should be able to manage. Salt water is not something that we make, even though it's listed here as an input. So we are also going to have to set up salt water production. But other than that, a lot of the inputs are very simple, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, sodium hydroxide, all of this stuff we can manage, water, very very simple. The main input though is going to be platinum metallic powder, which we are making over here from the centrifuge. We have one and a half thousand. We also do make it from various ores, we have I think, yeah, three thousand in total. But at some point soon we're going to set up dedicated processing for platinum metallic powder, which is what this is here for. But these are just sitting here unprocessed because we still need the machines and the setup to get platinum metallic powder efficiently. We can definitely work with what we've got though. This one and a half thousand or three thousand total will definitely get us places. But not without any machines, right? So over the next few hours I went through the flowchart and NEI thoroughly, trying to wrap my head around this platinum line. I also started to plan out a placement for all the machines. I gave each one a sign marking the number of inputs and outputs, as well as the tier of the recipe, or at least which voltage we're going to run the machine at. And yeah, this took me forever to go through the full line and plan everything out. But as you'll see, it, I think it's going to be worth it. It's going to speed the next part of this process up significantly. Before we move on though, I have to express my gratitude to Ruba, one of the members of the community, one of our patrons, who put together this little gif here. Check this guy out, check out little three down there. <laughs> I think I've seen this about a hundred times already and, and still it makes me smile so much. Look at that, it's just perfect. The little flip that he does, or that I do rather, <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. So thank you Ruba. And there's also a few more as well, I think there's one of me thinking, which I guess came from that animation, but yeah, huge, huge thank you to Ruba right there. Oh, that is so awesome. It's so, so awesome. And something else that's awesome is I think... Uh, <laughs> okay, first of all, I, I know there's going to be mistakes in, in this uh, whole layout here. There is no way we make it through this video without realizing I missed the machine or I wrote the wrong thing on the sign. There's also a few writer's notes here, as you'll see. Things which I am definitely going to forget later on. So anyways, we have some EBFs along this wall. We also have two distillation towers on the end. All of the middle section is, is large chemical reactors. And then on this side we have a mix. We have got a sifter, a mixer, an electrolyzer, some single blocks, an oil cracking unit, more LCRs, a mixer, two mixers, and more LCRs. And yeah, I think in total it's going to be 20 LCRs, maybe 21. I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. Six EBFs, a sifter. There is a couple of occasions where I've left space for the multi-block, like here. This is for rhodium filter cake solution or something or other. I don't even know the crazy names of these things. Rhodium filter cake dust. No, rhodium filter cake solution. Yeah, made in the mixer. This one here is 15 seconds, so that might warrant a multi-block. But normally the advantage, one of the advantages of the multi-block is you don't have to deal with cells. And that might be the case here at Aqua Regia. This one I am actually really torn about because this needs two cells, nitric acid and diluted sulfuric acid, but it's 1.5 seconds at LV, so that is like 0.375 HV if you overclock. It's going to be blazing fast either way, so I'm, I'm kind of not sure. Just in case though, I did leave space for it, so we've got it in like a 3x3 three three sectioned off area. And same thing applies here for the electrolyzer, I'm not sure if we're going to go multi-block electrolyzer. But yeah, even though I think there's going to be some adjustments, I think we are ready to proceed here. The main thing is we don't have to redo the, the full thing, so, so I'm pretty sure we're not missing any machines, that would be a catastrophe. Aha, so it's time to get into the thick of things now. I went ahead and crafted six large chemical reactors, the blast furnace, the sifter and the mixer, and that is really all we need for platinum. Sounds simple enough, right? But there's some things later on, like the the handling of some of the byproducts, which are going to get quite complex. 
So because of the complexity, we're going to try to keep this as uniform as possible. So we're going to have maintenance hatches above the machine controller, output hatches below the machine controller, energy hatches underneath, and inputs on the back side of the machines. And I'm hoping that is going to simplify the wiring. Okay, so for platinum, let's do things in order here. Actually, let me drop these other energy hatches, EV, EV, and the blast furnace will be EV. Here. Anyways, let's start at the very beginning here with ammonia. Now this, I know for a fact we're going to have to upgrade later on. In fact, maybe even add a couple of large chemical reactors for ammonia. But we can deal with that later. There's only so much future proofing you can actually do, right? Some, at some point you have to just start, <laughs> start setting up machines, right? So ammonia is actually really simple. It's just hydrogen plus nitrogen. So all we need to do is give it two input hatches on the back. P2P tunnels. And we'll connect these back to the main fluid storage tanks for, for hydrogen, which is here, and nitrogen, which is here. No, that's helium. Uh, nitrogen, which is here. Yeah, I'm just double checking we actually have these fluids. And it looks like the answer is yes, we do. I should have also pre-crafted some dense cable, which we are absolutely going to need here. And you might have also noticed I already ran a power connection over here as well using HSSG cable. This goes back to the main battery system. And then we are going to split this into five different sections. This one will serve as the blast furnaces. And then we'll have two down the middle, two lines down the middle, and then two more lines on this side of the room. And to be honest with you, I'm really hoping that we don't run into any immediate power issues. But I can already tell we don't have enough to run this thing like full time. Okay, so we're also going to have five P2P connections. And we'll go from left to right. I've already set up some tunnels on the other side. I don't remember what I called it though, was it Platinum? Yeah, Plat Line 1 will be here, that gives us 32 channels. And the rest I don't have configured just yet, so we've got Plat Line 1. We'll call this one Plat Line 2. Plat Line 3. 4. And do we have a fifth that is currently unnamed? I don't think we do, right? Yeah, so I guess one more P2P here. And we can link all of these back to the ones in the Plat Line room. All right, perfect. It looks like everything now has a channel. And speaking of channels, we have 32 times 5, 160. 160 channels. If we use 160 channels, I'm going to be very surprised. So yeah, now that we have the channels, let's actually take care of the power. This is the scary part. This is where things can explode, potentially. Okay, so <laughs> uh, let's actually remove some of these blocks underneath just to make it a bit easier. And I think for the plat line, we're going to do this together. And then for the most part, I'm just going to do the rest of this off camera because we're, we're never going to get anywhere if we keep going at this pace. But sometimes it's nice to just relax and uh, play some Greg tech, you know? <laughs> so yeah, we've got EV power here required. And I designed this to be non-linear. So for some of these processes, we're going to be jumping all over the place inside the room. But I wanted it to be easy to power. So for example... All of these large chemical reactors are EV. And we're going to think about this in rows of machines, right? Down this way, since this is where the power and the channels come from. So all of these ones are EV. And then we have two EV here. And then the rest are HV after that. All of these ones are EV up until the distillation tower. And this one has to be IV. But again, because of some of the power constraints of our current power setup, I, uh, I don't think we can run the whole thing at IV. So we'll just transform back up or maybe add a second power line down this down this way and then over here it's kind of a mix we're gonna go like ev and then the rest here are hv i don't know we can figure all that out later on but for now we just need a single 16x hv connection ev connection down here so we're going luv to iv we have i accidentally crafted six ev transformers one of those has to be high amp so we've got four amps of iv here four amps of iv converts down to 16 amps of ev and then that has to be sent on EV cable, which for us is aluminium. And check this out. Look at that. Look how much <laughs> look how much aluminium dust we have. That is just crazy. Okay, we should have a recipe here for 16x cable though. All right, so the first LCR is built. I connected up nitrogen and hydrogen to the relevant frequency. The other thing we have to do is take care of the output, which for this one is gonna go into the next machine to make ammonium chloride. 
However, ammonia is a fluid that we use often enough that we are going to send into main fluid storage. So I want to give it its own dedicated super tank. We may actually have some in here though. That's ammonium chloride, that's what we're going to, about to make. Uh, there's some spare platinum concentrate here in fact, from when we manually batch crafted platinum. Palladium and rich ammonia, yeah we're going to, about to make all this stuff automatically. It doesn't look like we have any ammonia here though. Oh there is some in the AE system. I just, I meant to type super tank there, but I accidentally typed ammonia. <laughs> okay, let's grab a super tank for main fluid storage. And I guess ammonia can get the next free space, which is here. Oh, I don't think we have enough channels here either. It's going to get its own P2P frequency, same as the rest of the tanks. I'll have to fix the channels here. Hold on. All right, ammonia should now have its own fluid storage tank. I also realized we do not have all of this plugged in. I ran the wire, but I only, for some for some reason, only ran it to here and not all the way down to the main battery, which is underneath the controller. Uh, let's fix that issue. It should still be disconnected, though, somewhere over there. If we hear an explosion here, I'm going to be so sad. We shouldn't, though, right? I do often hear them because of Thumbcraft Warp, and it catches me off guard every now and then, but it <laughs> looks like we're okay. So this is LUV cable. This goes all the way into the plat room. Oh, and we just emptied the green can. That's the first one I've ever emptied. We do have a spare though, not a big problem. Okay, so now before we fully connect up this first LCR, we do still have it disconnected here. For the output, we're gonna send the output hatch into another P2P, fluid P2P. And I've also switched to using covered cable here. It's really not all that much more expensive than the regular Fluix cable. We just have to coat it in rubber, which we have fully automated now. And I think it just looks a little bit nicer. We'll still use the glass cable, I think, until we can switch this out with a, a nice coloured cable whenever we rewire the controller. But at least for everything past the P2Ps here in the platline room, we are going to start using a covered cable, I think. Okay, so the output hatch will be sent back to the ammonia channel, and that should fill the tank in main fluid storage. And then for all of these, we're also going to need a machine controller and a fluid detector cover. And you guys know the golden rule by now, right? Redstone on, machine on and safe mode and the fluid detector cover will point into that sending a redstone signal oh yeah i forgot that would happen it's because we don't have power on right now but this should send a redstone signal if we have more than three buckets in the input hatch or less than three buckets in the input hatch and that will turn the machine on if this fills up then the machine should stop and i guess just for safety we're going to lock this for ammonia since that is the only thing we want to come out of this hatch and now if we plug in this cable here, I'm, you know what, I'm going to double check. <laughs> I'm going to double check, hold on. Now if we plug in this cable here and we re-enable the machine, we should start to make ammonia, right? Yes, every four seconds we're going to get a bucket of ammonia. So pretty simple up until now, right? This is all stuff we've done before. Just a very basic LCR. The next one here is going to be for ammonium chloride. And there's two recipes for ammonium chloride. There's there's a circuit one, which gives us one bucket at a time. Or there's a circuit nine, which gives us 64 buckets at a time. And we definitely want to use this one. So I made sure to craft EV input and output hatches for this one, which can hold double that amount in the recipe. So from here, I set up the LCR for ammonium chloride, combining hydrochloric acid and ammonia, which both of which we pulled from main fluid storage. I completed the multi-block structure and gave it the machine controller and fluid detector cover. Nice, so we're making ourselves ammonium chloride automatically now, and this is where things start to get a little bit complex. Ammonium chloride has to be combined with platinum concentrate, which we still have to make, and we are going to get ourselves five different outputs, all of which have to be recycled back into this platinum line and dealt with. <laughs> so let me set up a few more machines here. And I think it's going to be easier to explain once it's built. I have a feeling this might take me a little while, but nobody said this was going to be easy, right? <laughs> All right, LCR first. Oh, 
goodness, guys, it happened already. Already, we're missing machines. If you if you see uh, palladium salt dust anywhere, that's rhodium. This is sodium, more rhodium stuff. Uh, this is tetroxide solution. Palladium salt dust. This is what we need to process, but where do we make palladium salt dust? <laughs> oh my goodness, I cannot believe we just missed a whole line of machines. Yeah, you know the ones that I talked about right at the beginning of this episode? Uh, this one over here, where we have to send palladium enriched ammonia into the palladium line. Well, we're, I think we're missing all of these machines. Now this is catastrophic, this is not what you want to see here. I'm almost finished with the platinum line. Uh, it doesn't look almost finished, but I think I've got most of the things processed and filtered by now. And I was trying to decide where we want to send palladium enriched ammonia here. And I realized there's not a machine available for it. Okay, we're going to fix it, don't worry, we're going to fix it. But first of all, let me uh, take you through what we've got here. Actually, let me finish off what I was doing here first. <laughs> we'll take care of this, this fluid later on. Alright, let's make ourselves some platinum. We're almost there, we're, guys, we're almost there. This is the platinum dust here. And then we can go home for today, right? <laughs> oh no, this is... Uh, I can't believe how much st stuff we've still got to set up here. This is crazy, this is honestly nuts. But yeah, from where we were at, ammonium chloride is sent into the top input hatch here. And that is going to mix with platinum concentrate, which we're making in the next LCR here. Now, platinum concentrate does have 28 different recipes. And you can reduce the amount of PMP dust. This is the one we're making from crops that I showed at the beginning of the episode. You can reduce the amount of this you have to input if you give it also some purified ores. So down here at ore processing, which I actually had run out of power earlier today. So I think we're actually on like the cutting edge of how much we can support. Uh, I think we're going to have to expedite the process of upgrading power. But yeah, as you can see here, the middle three here can be used for platinum. However, this is already complex enough and it doesn't necessarily give you any extra, it just reduces the amount of input. So for right now, we're going to go with a basic circuit 9 recipe. This one here, platinum metallic powder, circuit 9 and 9 buckets of aqua regia gives us platinum residue dust. This is the input to the iridium line, which we do have a machine uh, lined up for. I think it's a blast furnace over there. <laughs> so that we can take care of later on. For now, it's just coming out of the output bus into a drawer. The aqua regia we make in a mixer. I decided to go single block. And to get around the cell issue, we're just using some tanks and some conveyors to pass the empty cells between the machine. So that outputs aqua regia to the top side. I think I put that in manually. But Aquaresia should be fully closed loop. So this has a pump on the backside sent into a fluid P2P. And that is sent into this LCR. Then the Platinum Concentrate we are going to send into this LCR to mix with Ammonium Chloride. So I believe I already have a frequency set up for it here. Let's bind this one. That should now give it Platinum Concentrate. Yes, perfect. And I had to be really careful with the size of the input hatches for a lot of these machines. Wait, did it already start? It's already started the recipe, 17 seconds. And yeah, this, I suspect this is going to be one of the biggest bottlenecks in our system, in our platinum making process. Okay, so this is going to give us that, that uh, fluid we don't know what to do with, palladium enriched ammonia. For now, we're sending it into a super tank below. We're going to pretend that doesn't exist. That is just, <laughs> that is going to fill up this tank here. The diluted sulfuric acid we want to send back to the mixer to mix into aqua regia. So to do that, we're going to send it via a direct fluid P2P. And we're going to make sure this is a closed loop. So I have it closed here in the name. And there's only going to be two frequencies set for this. That should have went to the mixer, right? Yes, there is cells in the mixer. Perfect. And it also gives us nitrogen dioxide, which we're going to send into an input hatch here. It's going to like basically point into each other. So output hatch into the input hatch. And that is going to mix circuit 24, hopefully. We are missing the machine controller, fluid detector cover. Hey, wait a second. Where did it go? It's not in the input hatch here. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. Where did that just go? It's not in the output hatch next to it. I think we just... Did we have any... Wait, let me check the footage, hold on. Aha, I think I just found what happened here. So look at this. We have 32 buckets of nitrogen dioxide in the output hatch, right? I point that into the input here. And you can see in the tooltip here, there should be 32 buckets in the input hatch. And I look over to this machine. I don't notice this turns back on. And because these things are wall shading, 
This input hatch can technically count for this LCR as well. So I suspect this one ate it up and we had a recipe conflict somewhere. Since nitrogen dioxide has 11 pages of recipes, it's not just used to make nitric acid. Is there any circuit 2s? Yeah, this one. Nitrogen dioxide circuit 2, it must have made dinitrogen te tetroxide. But we have all the output hatches locked here, so we just lost a bunch of fluid. <laughs> Either way, we can't fit the input hatch here. I think we should be able to do something like this. And as long as it's in the middle slice, that means that this one can't take the contents of the input hatch here. So this one will make sure we lock to the nit nitrogen dioxide and we can point these into each other. The other ones here for nitric acid is just oxygen taken from fluid storage and we have a reservoir hatch here. A few of you guys have recommended I use this thing and it's, it's actually the best thing ever. Look at this. It does almost exactly what you'd think and just keeps the hatch full of water. Just passively, it just uh, generates water and keeps it in the hatch available for the machine to use. And it's gonna use it to make nitric acid, which we want to lock here somehow. There we go. And this nitric acid we want to keep separate from the other nitric acid. And you guys remember when I said we had 20 LCRs and not 21? And we have this little uh, writer's note here for <laughs> missing nitric acid. Uh, yeah, later on we also need nitric acid for something or other. It's one of these processes for rhodium. But this nitric acid is fully closed loop for aqua regia. So we want to make sure it only goes between this LCR and the mixer over there. So we are going to place another P2P on the output. And I've set up a frequency here similar to the diluted sulfuric acid. It should have closed in the name. Oh, we have to convert this to fluid first. Yeah, nitric acid closed. I'll have to get the fluid back for this though, since, <laughs> since we just voided it. And then the other two outputs for platinum salt dust, uh, or this LCR, is platinum salt dust and reprecipitated platinum dust. And this is the gold right here. This is what we're trying to get. So both of these will be sent back into our AE. Or should we buffer them in a drawer on site? Hmm. I'm just thinking because if we ever end up with no space in the drives, yeah, if we end up with no space in the drives, then the, the LCR could potentially void... You know what, We <laughs> if we end up with no space in the drives, then we have bigger problems. So I think we're just gonna take our chances here and all of the output will be sent back into our AE system. The salt dust is gonna be sent through the sifting machine, which I have mostly crafted. I'll have to finish this off, but the juicy reprecipitated dust is gonna be sent into the last LCR here. And I just realized we're missing one more input bus for this, meaning that we need two. Ideally, these are gonna be stocking input buses, but uh, <laughs> once we have enough platinum, we'll, we'll switch them out. So conveyor module interface, and all we have to do to make our platinum is combine calcium. We can request this in the first interface. And then also the reprecipitated platinum dust here. So that should start to fill both of these hatches, bosses I mean. Little bit of maintenance. Wait, incomplete structure. Did I miss the pipe casing? Aha, missing the energy hatch underneath. This one is going to be HV because it is pretty quick. And we have a 16 amp HV transformer here. And that's going to service the rest of the line. So now, item detector cover, machine controller, redstone on, machine on. If we have less than 32, start up the machine. Yes! <laughs> Check it out, we're making ourselves platinum and also calcium chloride. The calcium chloride we can actually... Uh, Electrolyze. We can electrolyze this for all of the calcium back and some chlorine back. For now, we're going to send all of this into the AE system. I believe we have another interface down there. For calcium chloride, we do have an electrolyzer planned for it here. Let's recharge the flight potion. I can't quite remember where else we make calcium chloride, but for now, we're just sending it into this centrifuge and we're pulling it via stocking input bus. Are we where? Maybe we're not. Is it the electrolyzer? Uh, I thought we were, but I guess we're going to add it here. Calcium chloride. And that should electrolyze into our calcium. Oh, this was another one that got turned off. I guess because of power. That's not, Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> that is really not good. And I'm also going to stop processing all of this red granite. This has given us all of the aluminium dust. That This is where it's coming from. And red granite, we are getting pretty much infinitely here from the crops. It's a, it's a really, really good deal, actually. But yeah, we're now making ourselves platinum dust. Kind of. I have to fix that little mistake we made with the voiding. But we can actually set up a smelting recipe now. In the multi-smelter. I think we'll do this like 
a stack at a time, half a stack at a time. And during the whole setup process, I've also been working on developing our auto crafting capabilities. And I discovered something I didn't think would work, but I kind of surprised myself. Alright, so you guys know for this whole Platinum line, I've been crafting a crazy amount of input and output buses and hatches. All of these LCRs take multiple hatches and buses each. And coming up here pretty soon, we're going to have to set up a handful of blast furnaces. And all of those things take coil blocks. I think I've settled on the fact that we're going to go Nichrome. The higher tier, the better, but I don't think we can afford HSSG. Since we also use that for power cable, that's what all this green cable is, HSSG. And we're kind of running out. Almost. We certainly don't have enough to sustain six blast furnaces worth of H HSSG coils. You know what? That actually reminds me. We should get some more of this through the blast furnace. Let's get another 512 nichrome dust, which of course we added a mixer recipe for, and I've also added the recipe for the coils, as you can see here. But hold on a second, this takes fluids, this takes molten canthal. How are we going to get ourselves molten canthal? Well, I was experimenting quite a bit here, and I added a new fluid extractor. Underneath the fluid extractor, we've got ourselves an interface, unsurprisingly. In fact, I think it's still called test. Let's switch this to Fluid Solidifier. And inside here we have some patterns. Glass, Canthal, and Tin. The Molten Tin we use to create Cooper Nickel Coils, which we also need in large quantities here for the LCRs. So now that we have the capability to handle fluids within AE, all we have to do is add a recipe, and it's going to look something like 104 millibuckets, 144 millibuckets, and one Canthal ingot. And that is going to be sent to the Fluid Extractor here. And if you guys have seen the Ore Processing episode, then you'll know that an interface doesn't accept any items. We have this on automatic extract, fluid auto output, I mean. An interface shouldn't accept any items if there's no storage destination. And we do not have a storage destination for molten canthal because for our fluid storage, we use direct or uh, individual tanks for everything. And these things all have filters. So if we try to insert molten canthal into a dual interface as a fluid, then it should have nowhere to go, right? And therefore, it couldn't complete the craft in Applied Energistics, and we wouldn't be able to craft our coil blocks. It turns out that is not the case with fluids. So, as long as we're recursively crafting with the fluid, with the Molten Canthal, and we don't directly request Molten Canthal, i.e. we request the coil and not the fluid, this way Applied Energistics will immediately use up the Canthal, then it turns out it does actually accept it in the interface here. I don't know if we'll be able to catch it. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> and you can hear the machine. Yeah, basically, it does allow it to go into the interface, and that can then be sent over to the PA over here. And, you know, back here, I've added a couple more uh, shenanigans. <laughs> this is getting more and more spaghetti every day. But we're running out of space for patterns pretty quickly. Yeah, it's here. Circuit number three in the dual interface, that's going to send the molten canthal into the buffer, and then into the hatch here. And long story short, we can create ourselves coils. You might have noticed during that explanation that we have an ME chest back here, which by the way, you can put in fluid storage cells in. But this thing, as you can see by the tooltip, is filled with garbage. Well, not garbage, we need it. <laughs> but for some reason, you can't partition these drives or filter it properly. Or maybe it's just because of this connection. But yeah, this is just here with a storage bus on extract only. So I want this fluid to be used first. We've got this on low priority. So once this empties out, I'm going to remove this. But yeah, this is a very, very simple way to add on-demand fluids. We also have molten glass in there as a recipe, which we use here for all of the hatches. All of the hatches take some form or some tier of tank, which takes an ingot of molten glass. But yeah, as long as we request the tank and not the glass recipe directly, then uh, th <laughs> things should work pretty flawlessly. Anyways, with that, we can start to build the second line in here, which I think is going to be for Iridium. And yeah, that is what we need all the blast furnaces here for. And I'll also start to work on the sifting machine, which is the rest of the plot line, I guess. Oh yeah, and fix this aqua regia, the fluid we voided. But yeah, from here we have a lot still to do. Let's do this.
Sometimes I think they're right, honey Sorry for the tears in your eyes Hey, love, give me just one more try Aha, uh -huh, so we are quickly approaching the second milestone in this build. I can't believe I'm only saying second, but yeah, here we are. <laughs> this is going so much slower than I thought it would, and this is just nuts. This is crazy. Everything is super expensive and time consuming and grind. I haven't grinded this much in... I mean, we're playing New Horizons, right? I haven't put in this kind of grind in a very long time. I've had some seriously grindy episodes in this series, but this might top everything. However, on the positive side, uh, we're getting through it. We are getting through things. And we're just about to hit Iridium. This is the last LCR for Iridium. As you can see back there, we have all the blast furnaces going. The reason there's Cooper Nickel is because we don't have enough Nichrome. Uh, there's not necessarily any order to it. This, this is just the, uh, <laughs> whenever we had the Nichrome available, basically. And I was setting this one up, so I thought we'll, we'll just fill the rest in with the uh, Cooper Nickel just to get these processes up and running. And that allowed us to filter these other LCRs. I've also been making use of the stalking input buses, which have been working a treat. Uh, we're missing an output bus, we're missing the machine controller, we're missing some casings on here. But yeah, it's pretty much just more LCRs, more LCRs. <laughs> I don't know if we have a large chemical reactor, we do. Yeah, I've went through so many materials, so many materials used, we're kind of broke now. That goes here. It's not necessarily just the material costs or filtering the machines. We also have to make sure things don't void, which is the default behavior on, on all of these LCRs if their output is full. And there's also some priorities we have to take care of. For example, in the Iridium line, right at the very end, we get some ammonia back. When making Iridium Chloride Dust, after the very long chain of blast furnaces, we eventually get to acidic Iridium solution made here. And then that is sent here and gives us some ammonia back. But we have to make sure we use this one first before it makes any fresh from the first LCR we set up. So on this LCR we have one of those wireless redstone gizmos, frequency 109. And the other side is of course on the main tank for ammonia, keeping 90 buckets in stock. I also discovered something not too long ago, about an hour ago. I discovered something that you guys are going to find extremely tilting. And it, because it, <laughs> it tilts me off the face of the earth. Look at this. I cannot believe it. I, I, I actually cannot believe it. Some of you might have spotted it before. But it's over here. Do you guys spot anything weird with this? Do you guys notice anything about this view? How about now? <laughs> How could I have possibly built this off center? And both of them are the same. Look at look at this. How did I not notice this before? Like, has someone just moved this whole ring? Or uh, moved the rooms? I could have sworn I built this in the center. <laughs> You'll be pleased to know that these rooms are not off. Because I, I did go and uh, double count everything after I noticed. <laughs> these rooms are not off. It's just the way that it happens to line up with the, the size of this circle. So we'll probably end up just expanding this wall back a few blocks. Yeah, yeah, I can't believe I've done that, though. <laughs> and none of you guys noticed either, so uh, maybe I shouldn't have pointed that out. Anyways, this last LCR for Iridium. I believe all we have to do is request a couple of items here. Calcium dust being one of them, again. And then also Iridium chloride dust. We should have some by now. Right? Yes, we do. And once we get this operational, that should be... I'm missing the machine controller, I believe. Wait, this gives us a fluid? Yeah, EV large chemical reactor, calcium, iridium chloride, gives us metallic sludge dust, residue dust. Some of the names on these dusts are just... <laughs> Who comes up with these names? It's just crazy. Yeah, look at our blast furnaces here. We're making refined platinum salt dust. That's not too bad. Then leach residue dust. Sodium ruthenate. Rarest metal residue dust. Iridium metal residue. IDD and then SDRD. Let's see if we can find what these are called. Let's go all the way back in the Iridium chain. 
Acidic iridium solution, we have this set up already. Iridium dioxide dust. Iridium metal residue dust. Yeah, it's this. Iridium dioxide dust. And sludge dust residue dust. This, by the way, is one of the byproducts which we haven't dealt with yet, but it's just all we have to do is send it through a centrifuge and it's going to give us some silicon dioxide back and gold dust. So it's not essential that we process it at the moment, meaning that it's not used for any anything else. It's just an, another nice byproduct to have. We may or may not set up a centrifuge in here somewhere, though, at the end. For now, though, it's just going into the AE system. And actually, for a lot of these dusts, we're sending it straight into the AE system. In previous builds and series, I normally hook up a drawer on site. And for some of the processes, like the sifter, that's exactly what we've done. 15 seconds. Yeah, like the sifter over there, we're, we're using external storage. But for everything else, we're pretty much just sending it back into an interface, like back here. We should see our iridium, briefly. <laughs> there it is. And yeah, we also get metallic sludge dust residue dust, which is another one of those dusts we just have to send into a centrifuge, and it's going to give us some nickel and copper dust back. There is some advantages and disadvantages to doing it this way, right? When we send things straight back into the AE system, we assume that we have space in the drives. That is something we have to be extra careful with now that we're uh, sending all of these valuable dusts back into AE. But I mainly want it so that we can have the fluids, not void. So we have like fluid detector covers and machine controllers on everything. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm actually... I'm debating whether or not we have the materials to actually finish this. Uh, I know for a fact we don't have the power to run it full time, as we discovered uh, a little earlier on. This should be calcium chloride. But yeah, I'm considering just putting my head down and finishing this whole thing. And those other those other LCRs that we missed, the seven that we missed is going to go here. So I guess there's also that. The biggest bottleneck for us though is the coils. And also all of the AE components. All of these interfaces are super duper expensive. It doesn't look it, but it really does add up. And I think we're actually quickly running out of Ceres Quartz. Yeah, almost. That stockpile is not going to last very long either way. <laughs> this has to also be calcium chloride. Sent into a fluid solidifier, right? Circuit number one. Yeah, this is the same dust that we got earlier. And this is being sent down to ore processing. Again, we might set up another electrolyzer up here. But for right now, we're just going to send it into AE and we're not going to worry about it too much. As long as it doesn't back up the iridium production. Alright, but yeah, I think with that, that is... Yeah, that is turning back on. That is iridium and platinum taken care of. We should actually turn on this uh, this EBF again. This is what is stopping our platinum production. But once this starts going again, this is what gives us some more platinum metallic powder. Or in other words, the input. We basically recycle some of it from the sifter. It goes through the blast furnace, it gives us some of the chlorine back and some of the platinum metallic powder back. And that joins the start of the process again. And we should start to see some of these first LCRs turning back on. Yeah, for platinum concentrate. And that is going to make whatever this is, platinum salt dust. <laughs> some of that sent to the sifter, then to the blast furnace, and then it goes nitric acid into platinum dust. And then the dust from here, the iridium residue dust, goes through f four blast furnaces. And then four LCRs and we get Iridium, eventually. Let's go ahead and check how much uh, Nichrome we have in the blast furnaces. Oh, nice. Excellent. I've tossed a few hundred in here over the last few hours. I did have one of them doing tungsten, but uh, I converted them both over to Nichrome full time. But this extra Nichrome should allow us to convert at least one more of the blast furnaces over. 16 more coils. Oh yeah, I already know what you guys... I should have mentioned this earlier. Three, you know you can wall shear, right? You can wall shear to save coils, you know? <laughs> yes, I know you can wall shear. But uh, it, it doesn't look quite as nice, especially with the blast furnaces. It's also a bit of a flex to not wall shear, right? So we're, <laughs> we're going to keep them separate as much as we can. And it's not a huge, huge deal. It's not like these things are, have 100% uptime. But yeah, the timing is actually not bad. A lot of them are only a few seconds because we're over overclocking them all to HV. This one gives us the rhodium sulfate, which is the start of the rhodium line. And this one gives us the start of the osmium line, which I think is the next one we're going to tackle. And yeah, for now, we're just sending the fluid into a super tank for buffer so that we can keep the dust flowing. And of course, we have uh, fluid detector covers on here. But underneath the tanks, we have the fluid P2P. And that will be sent somewhere. 
I'm not going to lie to you guys, this also takes a lot of willpower to get through this. And uh, despite all my complaining this episode, I am actually having a lot of fun. It is actually a lot of fun to do this, it just takes forever. And it's hard to show a lot of this because I cannot configure machines and do it on camera at the same time. Fortunately though, if we double check our flowchart, the biggest lines are done. The Iridium and the Platinum line, these are probably the two biggest. Rhodium looks pretty big, but honestly it's not that bad. It's just a lot of uh, LCRs. But yeah, look at this. Osmium is just a distillation tower and a large chemical reactor. Mm-hmm, distillation tower and large chemical reactor. Oh yeah, so they're almost set up, but this is the one I was referring to that needs IV power. So, we are going to have to make a decision under here. And for a start, we'll have to give it two EV energy hatches, because we can't quite make the IV energy hatch yet. Oh yeah, and that sometimes happens in 1.7. If you place a block and you're just out of reach of the block, then uh, the server doesn't agree on whether it's placed or not, and you get that situation you just saw there. Anyways, yes, we are going to have to give this EV power, but the rest of the machines up until here are... HV, the blue cable is HV, and I don't think we'll have enough amperage to transfer back up, or transform back up, since we also need another distillation tower here. So what I decided to do is bring another HSSG cable all the way down, transform LUV to IV, IV to EV, and the double EV energy hatch should be enough to run this thing at IV. So now all we have to do is send acidic osmium solution coming out of the blast furnace, we have a P2P, and that is going to go directly into the input hatch of the distillation tower. Wait, that's iridium. I <laughs> want to be careful here. We do have this plugged in, right? Uh, yeah, it's plugged in, I just didn't set the frequency. So, acidic osmium solution. This should start to fill now that we've bound the two frequencies together. Perfect. And now it basically just works like any other distillation tower. We should get it out of slot 2, the middle slice. Number three should be water, which I don't have an output hatch on. So in that case, we can just let it void, right? Yeah, the top one should give us water, which we're not interested in. It's going to convert acidic osmium solution into osmium solution. So we want to bind a P2P frequency directly on the output. Just osmium solution this time. And I always like to call them by their full name for the purposes of P2P. So now we'll also have to give it a redstone signal, right? To make sure it doesn't overproduce and void the output. So again, we can wireless fluid detector cover and wireless receiver. <laughs> These things are still super expensive for us at this point. I mean, the platinum cost is reduced, but it still costs us some EV circuits. We're going to say two buckets. Inverted. And this is going to be frequency 1235. The other side here should actually be on the maintenance hatch, pointing into a machine controller on the machine controller. Frequency 1235. 35. Analog mode. And then redstone on, machine on. Let's see, it still says incomplete structure here. For some reason. Do we need to have an output hatch on the top side as well? Yes, it turns out we do. Okay. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Let's do ourselves some maintenance. And it's already running. Seven seconds. And it is running at IV. You can see 7,680 EU a tick. We should be getting ourselves osmium solution. Let's lock the hatch here. The top one is water. We're just going to let that void. So now if we plug in the P2P... Come over to this LCR, which should already be, be configured. I've given this thing hydrochloric acid. We're going to ask for osmium solution. And if we haven't messed anything up, this should start on its own. Is it a bucket though? It does it take a, it takes a full bucket, yeah. And the distillation tower output is only a, a tenth of a bucket, so osmium is extremely rare. Did it start already? Do we have ourselves osmium dust? Yes. <laughs> Nice. We also get seven buckets of chlorine out of this, which ideally we want to be used first. This is another one of those priority situations with chlorine, which is a disadvantage to using fluid P2P, is you can't use any any priorities. So for things like this, I'm actually considering, even though we have the wireless redstone technology, I'm considering moving over to fluid storage buses, which do give you priority. Those are quite a bit more expensive though, so I think for now, Especially with chlorine, we get chlorine from the crops. We are just going to let it fill a super tank and void any excess. The important thing is we don't void any osmium dust. 
So we have an item detector cover on here. And we should have a machine controller, but we don't. Safe mode. Yeah, there we go. There's two pieces of osmium. And that, of course, we're just going to send back into an interface down here. Plug it into the dense cable, which we are also out of, by the way. But yeah, the cabling actually under here is ending up not too bad. I've tried to keep things as consistent as possible. Oh yeah, and of course, point this down. Yeah, and so now we have three dusts automated. Osmium, iridium, and platinum. And this should also be pointed down. One of the things I forgot to mention earlier is we're using some single blocks underneath the machines. For example, for potassium disulfate. We have we need to make this as a fluid, but there's no direct fluid recipe, so we have to fluid extract. And it's pretty quick, so we're just doing this at MV down here, and then we're directly sending that into a P2P tunnel, and then into one of these blast furnaces as input. And same thing for the salt water, actually. You remember I mentioned we need salt water? I just have a tiny little mixer tucked back here. <laughs> I bet none of you guys saw this. And we're just, of course, requesting salt dust and water from the reservoir. Mixing on circuit 3, and that goes straight into the input hatch of the blast furnace. But yeah, I've been monitoring things quite closely here, and things seem to be working very well. The increased power of these extra distillation, especially this distillation tower, is something I'm going to have to keep a very close eye on. But yeah, I think next up is going to be for rhodium which I believe begins all the way back here. <laughs> we have a bunch of chemical reactors, two mixers, more chemical reactors, and the final one is over here. And is this also part of the rhodium line? No, this is ruthenium. Maybe I'll do this one first. Yeah, ruthenium is quite a bit smaller than the rhodium line. R ruthenium is only a couple of LCRs. This is the one that also takes the oil cracker, but we do have space for that lined up. And we should also have the coils available now. Yeah, ruthenium doesn't actually look too bad. I think we can we can manage to do this one. And then also probably a rhodium. The palladium line, though, is the one that we didn't plan out. <laughs> this one up here. So we'll probably end up doing that last. Assuming we have the resources, of course. Resources pending. Let's see. We're also currently on 1,000... Oh, my goodness. 1,026 hours played. So stay tuned to see how long this takes me to complete the full thing. We should be able to get an hour count from when we first started this episode. But uh, yeah, for now, let's move on to the ruthenium. This is going to take a while. Oh yeah, I cannot believe we are finally here. We are at the finish line, guys, check it out. Oh no. <laughs> No, we're in a backup right here, and we're here to check the amount of hours. So this is a backup from the very end of last episode, and we were on 985 hours played. I take a backup after every single episode, and so yeah, this was just before I started to do all the digging. So 985, and if we join the main server here, 1034 hours to finish this thing. Three, you are crazy, and yes, uh, perhaps I am. Perhaps this was a huge, huge project, much bigger than I was anticipating. <laughs> and I definitely shouldn't have tried to do this in one go. I mean, it took me a few days. Uh, I did take multiple breaks in between, but yeah, check it out. It's finished. Oh my goodness, I'm so, I'm so happy right now. It's finished. <laughs> there is a few, a few things I've discovered though. We are missing one LCR and some redstone controls for palladium and rich ammonia. I'm not sure 100% how we're going to handle it, but I have a pretty good idea. It's uh, it's set up and ready to go though, which is why we're not going to see any palladium in here, other than the one that I batch crafted way at the beginning of the series. However, we, we now have a steady supply of osmium dust. Not too much because this takes quite a while, it's pretty rare. We should also be getting ruthenium dust. This one is also quite slow. The biggest bottleneck for ruthenium is the distillation tower on the end, which is 75 seconds. Uh, not a whole lot we can do about that, though, because of power. We should have a decent amount of iridium dust. Yeah, 631, that's really good. That's awesome. And then, of course, our main objective, platinum dust. Oh, 1600, look at that. <laughs> shiny, shiny platinum. And I think I've used about a stack, or maybe even two stacks, building this thing. Uh, because where possible, I try to use stocking input buses. And these things cost a few ingots of platinum each. I think it's actually 16 ingots of platinum per stocking input bus. 
so it's very expensive and we are completely broke right now. I do unfortunately have some other bad news, in fact very bad news, but uh, <laughs> let's stick with the positives for now. So I ended up going for single blocks after all in the mixers and these are definitely not a, a bottleneck. It actually looks pretty cool with the, the tungsten steel pipe up here to supply water. But yeah, both of these recipes, rhodium filter cake dust and rhodium salt solution, are less than a second each at HV. So these won't be a bottleneck for a very, very long time. One thing we might have to watch out for is this combination here, fluid solidifier and macerator. This takes some of the molten potassium out of leach residue dust and basically just converts it back into dust for us. Fluid solidifies into ingots and then into dust. But we get like eight buckets at a time, so that it may not be fast enough. We'll have to keep an eye on that. But I mean, even if we void a little bit of potassium, it's not the end of the world. Other than those few things, I did try to keep it as future-proof as possible. And look at the wiring under here. <laughs> I'm actually pretty proud of this, if I do say so myself. Wait, it looks like we have a kink in the wire here. Let's sort that out. I tried to keep them as straight as possible. And I think it actually turned out pretty cool. What do you guys think? We have a crazy transformer situation down here as well. All of the palladium line is running at LV, which is not exactly ideal. But again, because of power, I don't really think we can afford to push our luck too much right now. On the channel situation as well, we're actually using a, uh, quite a lot of channels here. There's 19 here, uh, 10 here. But this one also shares down here. This is also plat line one. So there's another 19 on this line. On the middle two, we have 25 channels and 22 channels. And then also on here, we have 17 channels. So we're <laughs> like, we're pretty capped on channels here. And that has a huge knock on effect on power. And I hate to say it, but we actually had the AE system run out of power. And as a result, we can no longer sustain item movement between the farm. We can no longer power this transceiver, at least not here. 3.2, that's what, that's like an extra thousand from when we last checked, right? Oh my goodness, look at our network now. This is crazy. We also unfortunately ran out of hydrogen not too long ago, about two hours ago. I did refill it manually, but this is going to run out very fast. Yeah. So yeah, we have some new puzzles to solve, but uh, most importantly, we achieved our mission and then some. Yeah, I'm very happy with how this turned out. I think, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I think it's definitely better than the season one attempt, right? And we're working with some of the new gadgets like the reservoir hatch, which is awesome, and the stocking input buses. Oh yeah, we do also have to add uh, Emmy output buses. We have everything going into regular interfaces right now. So that is another thing on the list to uh, adjust here. But yeah, other than some of the finer details, this is pretty much good to go. And I'm very happy about this. Oh, we still have to do the window here as well. I completely forgot about this. <laughs> I guess that maybe puts it up to 50 hours on this whole project. After we finish the window and some of the building things. A nice round number. Oh, what was I thinking? 50 hours was just completely insane. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it all the way to the end. Once again, special thanks to Ruba, who made the awesome animation. That is going to be it for today. Have an absolutely fantastic day, and I'll see you all in the next episode of New Horizons. <laughs>